We're going to start our Good Friday service off with a song. It is called The Wonderful Cross, or The Wondrous Cross. So I'm always going to put the words on the screen. So if you want to stand, we will sing.
Our scripture tonight comes in the book of Isaiah. Sue is going to read that for us. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, living, stricken for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sue. <clears throat> Tonight, the uh, response for our litany for Good Friday is, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Our Savior now enters into the valley of the shadow of death, where evil awaits in anticipation. Lord, Lord have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Our Savior submits now to the worst that all the powers of the earth and hell can array against him. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Our Savior suffers by human wiles twisted in torture, yet intercedes on behalf of the good of all. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. Though we stand at a distance, we pray with our Lord. We pray for all in the world who know the trauma of death's ever stalking presence and destruction's delight in feeding upon our fear. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. We pray for all who scoff at this cross because they have been wounded by it or because they do not understand. Lord have mercy. We pray for ourselves who choose to stand at a distance, afraid to enter into the
the full mystery of your redemptive power. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. In this trembling hour of terror, O oh God, grant us faith that we may continue to trust in your presence even when defeat and despair triumph. In this hour of dread, grant us hope that through our Lord, that though our Lord is dead and, and buried, his spirit of compassion may remain with us. Through your grace, help us to believe that your faithfulness will triumph even when our faith flees and darkness rules the day. This we ask through Christ, your Son, our brother and Lord. Amen. I want to welcome you all to our Good Friday service. This is kind of a different type of a service in the United Methodist Church. It's a night that we remember the crucifixion and the loss and the death of Christ. Uh, it's a time where we remember the worst. We remember our own sinful nature. We remember that Christ chose to die on our behalf and to come into this world for that purpose. We remember that we are not good enough. We're not good enough on our own. But through our, the sacrifice of Christ and through our acceptance of that sacrifice, it's all it takes that we can be redeemed and renewed in our relationship with God Almighty. You know, the word Good Friday in itself is kind of counterintuitive. You know, what, what's good about it? Uh, in actuality, the original root word uh, back in the early days of the church uh, was translated as holy. Today is actually Holy Friday. And somewhere along the lines, they changed it to Good Friday. It was, it was kind of changed in the centuries centuries ago, but, but in actuality it means that this is an extremely holy day. A day that Creator God came down and allowed Himself to be bruised and burdened and killed for the transgressions, for the sins of my life as well as yours. It's a day that we remember. It's a day that some of us accept. It's a day that all of us really should rejoice in. And I say rejoice because through this sacrifice that we remember tonight, uh, we have a great hope. We have a wonderful hope. We have a tremendous new beginning. And that new beginning is through Christ. It is with God eternal. And it is a, as I said, eternal. There is no end to it. That is the best news I could ever share with another human being. And that is that through the sacrifice that we remember tonight, you are forgiven. With a solemn heart, I want to go through a reading for you tonight of exactly what took place 2,000 years ago. A time when Jesus gave us all that he had to give. While I do that, I'll let you simply focus on the cross of Christ. Jesus is bowed and bloody. 110 pounds of lumber is strapped across his shoulders. The weight of the rough wood proves too much as it grinds against the lacerations left by the Roman scourging. Pain explodes like light in Jesus' brain, and he crumbles under the beam. When he comes to, Jesus somehow feels weightless as he realizes that the wooden cross beam has been cut from his back. Another man is carrying it now, a dark man whose face he cannot see. But he does see the face of another. Mercifully, a Roman centurion bends and takes Jesus under his arm to lift him gently to his feet once again. Jesus looks up and holds the soldier's 
captive in his gaze. The victim's eyes do not pierce the centurion with the hatred that he expects. Instead, he finds love in his eyes. Love mingled with pain. Yes, with the broken-hearted love, but nonetheless love. And not a love excited by one mere act of kindness. This love that he sees preceded the moment. This love preceded his existence. This love preceded the existence of the world. Somehow the centurion knows that these are the eyes of eternal love. And Jesus holds the soldier's gaze as long as he can. But the blood that drips off the end of the stairs to the ground when he was bent low under the cross now drops into his eyes. The blood mixed with sweat stings and Jesus blinks. And by this time Friday, Jesus is familiar with that stain. But it was a new sensation on Thursday night in the garden. There in the garden he walked with his friends, singing hymns and speaking quietly. They passed through the city gate and walked up the hill of Gethsemane through the olive trees. But there were only 11 friends with Jesus, not 12. One of the 12 chosen proved no friend at all. Satan already held Judas, the betrayer, by the hand and now has him by the neck. Judas hangs pale and gasping, swinging from the end of his belt under the limb of a tree. And the flames of hell are already lapping at his feet. It would have been better if he had never been born. The eleven remain. But soon there would be none. No one, no friend would stay. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. One would run terrified out of the garden naked and the rest would follow. And Jesus fell on his face in prayer. He tasted the dirt as he fought for the eternal destinies of his eleven sleeping sheep, just a stone's throw away. Let the cup pass, he cried. Father, if possible, let this cup pass. And the father gazed lovingly at his son and the son stared back knowingly. Your will will be done, Father, whispered the son. And the father held out the cup and Jesus looked in. What he saw there flung him into the throes of agony. He pressed his forehead deep into the dirt, which softened into mud when mingled with his tears. Jesus felt several small explosions of pain underneath the skin on his face. His tiny capillary is in the sweat glands burst under the stress and the blood flowed through his pores and dropped into his eyes and it stopped. Jesus lifted his head to the sky and cried out, I will drink from this cup, Father. I will drink from this cup so that your glory may be vindicated and my name will be glorified. And so that the sheep that you have given to me will see our glory and enjoy it forever. I will drink on behalf of our rescue mission. Just then, through blurry eyes, Jesus saw the line of torches slithering like a snake up the hill to the garden. The mob arrived. Judas kissed. Friends fled. Soldiers arrested. And Jesus' world became a swirl of torment and mockery. His trial was a sham as liars lied and mockers mocked. God claimed to be God and it was called blasphemy. And the face that Moses longed to see, the face that he was forbidden to see, was slapped and spittled. More blood in the eyes, more stinging. And he was dragged from the high priest's house. Jesus managed the bloody eye glance of Peter. This friend ran from the garden, but this friend followed. And this friend had done the unthinkable three times. This friend denied the friend of friends. This friend denied the friend of sinners. He invoked a curse to lend credence to his denials. 
and now the cock crowed. And Jesus held Peter at a gaze of eternal love. But Peter looked away and ran. Just outside of the city gate, he stumbled and fell to the ground, heaving sobs and considering joining Judas on the tree. But he pleaded to the Father for forgiveness instead. And the Father looked a few hours into the future, the Friday afternoon, and on behalf of what he saw there, he granted Peter the forgiveness he requested. The governor of Judea was up early this cold gray Friday morning. The city still slept as the priest and the soldiers led Jesus to the palace of Pontius Pilate. But soon the priest would have a sympathetic crowd as news of Jesus' arrest passed from house to house. They leveled their charges. This man forbids us to pay tribute to Caesar, and he calls himself a king. Pilate stared intently at Jesus. He questioned him, and he found no guilt. Neither did King Herod. So Pilate offered to release Jesus to the swelling crowd. But they chose freedom for the murderer Barabbas instead. Then what should I do with this Jesus of Nazareth? Pilate shouted to the mob, and the mob thundered back, crucify him, crucify him. And their voices prevailed. Pilate washed his hands and delivered the innocent one to death. The next Jesus was stripped and his hands were tied above his head to a post. A large shirtless Roman legionnaire stepped forward, fondling a short whip. Several heavy Leather throngs hung off the handle, weighed down by small balls of lead attached near the ends of each. The muscles in the legionnaire's back and arms bulged as he brought down the heavy whip. With full force, again and again and again, across Jesus' shoulders and his back and his legs. The Jews would have been more merciful, no more than 39 lashes. But the Romans extended no such mercy. And the balls of lead yielded large, deep bruises. Then the bruises were eventually opened by the endless blows. The thongs cut through the skin, and when they cut deeper, they cut into muscle. From behind, Jesus no longer looked human. His skin hung in long, bloody ribbons. Fearing they had gone too far and killed Jesus before it was time, the soldiers cut him loose. And he fell in an unconscious heap at their feet. As Jesus came to, he was forced to stand. A purple robe, not his own, was wrapped around him and clung to his open wounds. They made him hold a stick, a mock scepter. And now the king of the Jews needed a crown. And one of the Roman soldiers picked up a thorn branch from a pile of firewood and braided it into a circle. Never did thorns compose so rich a crown, or so painful a crown. Another soldier took the scepter from his hands of the king of kings and beat the crown into his skull. Bloody sweat blinded him, and his stinging eyes momentarily took his mind off the pain in his back. But then the purple robe was torn from Jesus, and ribbons of flesh that adhered to the cloth were ripped off with its removal. Each wound had a voice of its own to shriek its own pain, and Jesus collapsed again. Now Jesus is dressed in his own clothes, and before the merciful centurion could move, Jesus along behind the dark man now carrying the cross, an old woman approaches wipes Jesus' face with a linen cloth. Jesus looks into her eyes and then looks to the crowd of weeping women behind her. And he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us 
to the hills, cover us. And to the old woman he adds, if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Then Jesus walks on beyond the city gates. It's nine o'clock in the morning on Friday. Through the steady rain, Jesus glances up from the base of a rocky hill. His name is Golgotha, the place of the stone. At the top, he sees several posts fixed into the ground. Three of these poles stand ready to receive their crossbeams. And the tattered body of Jesus and the two criminals carrying their crosses behind him. At the top of the hill, the merciful centurion hands Jesus a cup. Jesus sniffs the liquid. It's wine mixed with myrrh, a mild narcotic to dull the pain. But Jesus is meant to feel all the pain. So he hands the cup back. This is not the cup of the Father. And the soldier strips Jesus. Again, his back is set on fire. His skin tears away with the cloth. And Jesus now lays naked in the dirt. The dark man places the crossbeam by Jesus' head. This time, Jesus sees his face. It is Simon of Cyrene. Jesus knows him by name and did before there was time. The beam becomes his pillow. The two men take hold of his hands. The soldier on his left yanks at his arm as far as it will go, but the soldier to his right is much gentler. Jesus turns to him, and it is the merciful centurion again. He picks up a cold spike and places it to Jesus' wrist. And then he picks up a hammer and their eyes meet. Eternal love shines forth again and the centurion is undone. He looks away and lifts his hammer. And in that moment, Jesus hears his own word of power. The word of power that holds the merciful centurion in existence. The word of power that causes the hammer to be. He's speaking it all into being. The soldiers, the priests, the thieves, the friends, the mothers, the brothers, the mob, the wooden beams, the spite, the thorns, even the ground beneath him, and the dark clouds gather above. If he ceases to speak, they will all cease to be. But he wills that they remain, so the soldiers live on and the hammers come down. And Jesus is lifted on his cross beam to the post. He sags, held only by the specks in his wrist. Jesus designed the nerves in his arms that are now working perfectly. Pain shoots up those nerves and explodes in his skull as the cross beam is set into place. His left foot is now pressed against his right. And both feet are extended, toes down, and the spike is driven through the arch of each. His knees are bent. Jesus immediately pushes himself up to relieve the pain in his outstretched arms. He places his full weight on the spikes in his feet and they tear through the nerves between the bones. Splinters from the post pierce his lacerated back in searing agony. Quickly, waves of cramps overtake him, deep throbbing pain from his head to his toes. He's no longer able to push himself up and his knees buckle. He's hanging now by his arms. His pectoral muscles are paralyzed. Jesus can inhale, but he can't exhale. His compressed heart is struggling to pump blood to his torn tissue. And he fights to raise himself in order to breathe and in order to speak. He looks down at the soldiers now gambling for his clothes. He pushes himself up through the violent pain and prays aloud, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But then he sags back into silence. The crowd is not silent. Though he can barely hear their taunts through the din of his pain. He saved others. Let him save himself. If you're the Christ, come down off the cross. Save yourself, King of the Jews. 
The criminal on the cross to his left joins the mockery, but the thief to his right repents. Jesus pushes him up to say himself up to say, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It's now noon. And the rain falls harder and the clouds blacken. Jesus looks down through wet strands of hair into the familiar face of a woman. And a new pain grips him. Greater pain than all of the whips and spikes in the kingdom of Rome. It is his mother. She's sobbing so hard that her breathing is as labored as his. And without words, she looks into his eyes and begs to know why. He longs to hold her and to tell her that it's all for her. And he pushes upward and says, Woman. And then he looks to his friend John and he says to John, Here is now your son. And then to John, Jesus murders, and she is now your mother. Take her and go away from you. And he sags back into silence, back into the countless hours of limitless pain. Then Jesus is startled by a foul odor. It isn't the stench of open wounds. Something else. And it crawls inside of him. He looks up to his father. And his father looks back. But Jesus doesn't recognize these eyes. They pierce the invisible world with fire and darken the visible sky. And Jesus feels dirty. He hangs between earth and heavenly, filthy with human discharge on the outside, and now filthy human wickedness on the inside. Finally, the Father speaks. Son of man, why have you sinned against me and heaped scorn on my great glory? You're self-sufficient and self-righteous, consumed with yourself and puffed up and selfishly ambitious. You rob me of my glory and worship what's inside of you instead of looking to the one who created you. You're greedy and lazy and gluttonous and a slander and a gossip. You're lying and conceited you're ungrateful, cruel, and an adulterer. You practice all types of immorality. You make pornography and fill your minds with vulgarity. You exchange my truth for a lie and worship the creature instead of the creator. And so you were given up to your passions. You dress immodestly and you lust after that which is forbidden. With all of your heart you love perverse pleasure. You hate your brother and murder him with the bullets of anger fired from your own heart. You kill your babies for your convenience. You oppress the poor and deal slaves and ignore the needy and persecute my people. You love money and prestige and honor. You put on a cloak of outward piety, but inside you are filled with dead men's bones. You hypocrite. You're lukewarm and Easily enticed by the world. You covet and you can't have, so you murder. You're filled with envy and rage and bitterness and unforgiveness. You blame others for your sin, you're, and you're even too proud to call it sin. You're never too slow to speak, though, because you have a razor tongue that lashes and cuts with its criticisms and its sinful judgments. Your words do not impart grace. Instead, your mouth is a fountain of condemnation and guilt. You're a false prophet, leading my people astray. You mock your parents. You have no self-control. You're a betrayer who stirs up division. You're a drunkard and a thief. You're an anxious coward, and you do not trust me. Instead, you blaspheme against me, and you are an unsubmissive wife. You're lazy, disengaged, and you crush the parable of my love for the church. You practice divination and worship demons. And the list of your sins just goes on and on and on. I hate these things inside of you. I'm filled with disgust and indignation. For your sin consumes me. Now drink my cup. And Jesus does. He drinks for hours. He downs every drop of scalding liquid. 
lit with God's hatred of sin, mingled with his own white hot wrath. This is the Father's cup. Omnipotent hatred and anger for the sins of every generation, past, present, and future. Omnipotent wrath directed at one naked man hanging on a cross. The Father can no longer look at his beloved Son, his heart's treasure, the nearer image of himself, and he looks away. And Jesus pushes himself upward and howls to heaven, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there's silence and separation. And Jesus whispers, I'm thirsty, and he sags. Then the merciful centurion soaks a sponge in sour wine, and he lifts it on a reed to Jesus' lips. And the sour wine is the sweetest drink he'd ever tasted. Jesus pushes himself up again, and he cries, It is finished. And it is. Every sin of every child of God has been laid on Jesus. And he drank the cup of God's wrath dry. It's three o'clock, Friday afternoon. And Jesus finds one more surge of strength. He presses his torn feet against the spikes, straightens, straightens out his legs, and with one gasp of air, he cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he dies. The merciful centurion sees Jesus' body fall far forward and his head drop low. He thrusts a spear out behind Jesus' ribs, one more piercing for our transgression. And water and blood flow out from his broken body. In that moment, mountains shake and rocks split, veils tear and tombs open. And the merciful centurion looks up at the lifeless body of Jesus and is filled with awe. He drops to his knees and declares, Truly this was the Son of God. Mission accomplished. Sacrifice accepted. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betrayed. But Sunday is coming. It's right. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilified. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's right. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denied. But they don't know that Sunday's a cup. It's right. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scarlet. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sunday's a cup. It's right. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burden. What you see is only right. Sunday's come. It's right. The world's win. People are sinning. And evil's grim. It's right. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's right. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's right. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know it's only Friday. Sunday's cut. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. 
But Sunday's coming. It's right. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has come. And Satan just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is dead. A soldier stands guard. And a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. If you would stand, we're going to sing a song called Revelation Song. Please <coughs> repeat. Yeah. 
go forward tonight, I know that today is a difficult day in the Christian church. Again, we, we leave the service tonight remembering our own sinfulness before a holy and perfect God. But as the video said, Sundays are coming. God bless. Have a good night. And I'll see you Sunday.